We are delighted uh, to have uh, Arthur Breitman, uh, co-founder uh, of uh, Tezos, uh, joining us today for an AMA uh, with the ENCODE Club, uh, kind of audience of university students, researchers, and developers and hackers. Uh, I know there are a lot of kind of leaders of the student clubs we work with at ENCODE Club uh, from across the world, over from Europe to America, probably not the Asian uh, universities today, this is slightly the wrong time zone for them, uh, but, uh, and, uh, and a number of universities in Africa. Uh, and um, South America as well. So thank you all for joining today uh, and uh, for this event. Uh, the style is our usual AMA style for those of you that have kind of been here before. Uh, we'll start off with kind of 15 qu uh, minutes of questions from myself uh, to get the conversation started. And then after that, uh, we will um, open the question up, uh, uh, open the questions up uh, to kind of you, all, you all to ask whatever you want. Uh, you can either ask a question uh, with your video on and ask it kind of face to face, uh, or you can put it in via chat. Uh, usual kind of rules apply everyone. Uh, this please be respectful. This is a nice, happy, uh, safe space. Uh, so uh, please do be good people. And if you do notice any bad actors, as it can happen with any event, uh, do let myself or George know and we'll kind of get on it uh, immediately. That is the housekeeping. Arthur, it's such a pleasure to have you. Uh, a few words on Arthur's background for the, the few that might not know. Uh, Arthur, um, as I said, founded uh, kind of Tezos, uh, which the original ideas of which kind of came around in 2014 uh, before um, the, 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 the project raised money and then built into the beer of it is uh, today uh, in, in 2021. Uh, Arthur previously studied maths. I'm sure we'll get into kind of yeah, your, your kind of what it was like being when you were a student, whether you had kind of ideas uh, around ever building a company. Uh, he worked uh, in banking uh, for Goldman uh, Sachs, for instance, and also uh, as an engineer uh, at Google X and Waymo before finding uh, Tezos and going knee deep into the crypto uh, space. Uh, so Arthur, thank you so much for being here this evening. And uh, I, I wanted to kind of start with a, a very kind of basic, easy question, which we always ask. So what was a kind of uh, a 21 year old Arthur thinking about what he was gonna do with his life? Did you, did you see yourself becoming a founder, an entrepreneur? Did you see yourself becoming a researcher? Did you just wanna get a, get a job? What was your kind of approach to life at, at 21? Uh, 21, let's see, what did I want to do in, uh, in, uh, in, in 21? I think probably, yes, um, I, uh, I, I, I saw myself as uh, working probably in, in, in some area related to, uh, to software, uh, uh, tech company or machine learning. Okay. Uh, that's what I, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I had in mind at the time. Excellent. Uh, and um, what, what was your early career like work as a working man? Did you enjoy it? Was it kind of always missing something what was your kind of yeah you see so you had you have both sides you did the kind of banking side and you did the kind of uh, silicon yeah. valley startup side so what was your experience with that i think it's, um, i struggled a bit in my early career uh with um with being able to focus on the task at hand as opposed to the task i was most interested in you know um sometimes you know you're, you're an employee somewhere and there's a very clear uh business need for doing something and it's not necessarily the most interesting thing that there is to be done. And I think I really had a tendency to get sucked into finding a cool problem that was hard to solve, as opposed to finding, as opposed to working on the easier problem that actually needs to be solved. And I think it took me years to um, years and years to get rid of that. Not even sure that I did get rid of it. You know, the, the only thing, the, the thing that really worked like magic was uh, basically being an entrepreneur and, and, and working for for myself. I did have, you know, before. Uh, jumping uh, head first in Tezos, I had a uh, you know I worked as a uh, as a portfolio manager at a small prop shop. So I was in finance, but I was you know I was managing my own book, writing my own thing, uh, and I just noticed uh, all of a sudden I started caring a lot more about the bottom line and whether or not what I was doing was relevant to uh, to to the, to the success as opposed to uh, interesting in its own right. Mm. And what was the kind of what kind of motivates you both kind of now and then? Is it Kind of solving a big problem is it kind of kind of doing something amazing is it the kind of technological curiosity what was the kind of motivation both kind of before you did tezos and, and generally uh, kind of uh, your approach to life uh a lot of it is spite <laughs> I, I i i'm kidding 50 percent it is it is a very powerful force you know i really got into this because people were wrong on the internet and <laughs> at least originally 
And I was like, how, you know, how can you say this about proof of stake? How can you say this about fork based governance? I'll show you. Uh, so it is, you know, it is a surprisingly powerful force. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I, I say spy itself deridingly, but, you know, in, in, the, the more uh, flattering way to say this is that, you know, you have, a, uh, you have a philosophical thesis about the world and you want to show that it's correct and you want to show that it's true. So that's, you know, that, that sounds already a lot more, uh, <laughs> a lot more uh, acceptable and, uh, and laudable as a uh, as a force. I also tend to be pretty competitive, which uh, you know, in, in some sense, I also got into crypto because I was able to set my competitiveness aside. Uh, you know, especially at the time I was, you know, I, at the time before I got in, into this, I was working in AI, I was working in finance, which were both extremely competitive, a lot more competitive than the crypto space in 2015, 2016. I mean, you know, there was just like not a whole lot of expertise or professionalism. So I was like, you know, I'm going to try to not be too competitive and focus on, on, on this because there's more opportunity. Um, so that, that, that's, also, that's also a drive. And then on top of that, there's also, I think the mission is very interesting. Uh, for me, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, they have, it's not just a technological appeal that they have, it's also a philosophical and political appeal. And I often say, you know, the usual question uh, from every podcast, everything about crypto is like, how did you get into crypto? And my usual answer uh, is, uh, look, it was in the intersection of a lot of things that I was interested in, cryptography, mathematics, uh, serial finance and banking, uh, but also uh, political philosophy. Um, and there's, you know, there's a very strong uh, undercurrent of individual sovereignties that underpins all of that. And something that resonates very strongly with me. And so, you know, obviously it's a big part of my, uh, of my involvement in uh, uh, in this. Absolutely. I was going to try and avoid the cliche, uh, why did you get involved in crypto? So I'm really pleased you answered that without me having to do so. Um, <laughs> there we go. Let's delve into cliche a little bit. So um, the kind of original rumblings of Tezos from what I read were kind of back in 2014, but the project really came to life in, in 2017. Um, you said you founded kind of Tezos in, in, in kind of part uh, because out of spite and competitiveness and wanting to prove something. Um, based on your goals in kind of then, back then, how many of those would you say have you achieved? What is left to achieve at this point with the Tezos project? Uh, well, I mean, there's some goals that have been achieved, and I don't know if they've been achieved solely by Tezos, but at least, you know, the people, you know, the people who were wrong have been proven wrong. I think, you know, when, when, when Tezos started, proof of stake was extremely French. Uh, no one, you know, like you would talk about proof of stake and you were dismissed immediately as a crank talking about perpetual motion machines. Uh, and this was based on the arguments that you can costlessly simulate another chain and therefore it can never work. And we can get into that later, but I, I don't think it's a very compelling argument against proof of stake. But now proof of stake has won. Like there's not a serious chain today that's launching that's proof of work. And the arguments in favor of proof of stake just keep accumulating every day. So, you know, in some sense that vision has won. Uh, governance, no one, absolutely no one was talking about governance in the crypto space before Tezos. And, um, you know, we, we started a dialogue on governance uh, and now there's not a single project that doesn't talk about governance. So again, you know, we, we, I, I, I think it, in terms of like um, the memes, <laughs> we, we definitely want to hear uh, formal verification of code bases and why it's relevant to, uh, to smart contracts. Again, we were the first to start talking about this uh, in details. Uh, and now it's and now it's taken as a given. So in, in some sense, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, thesis behind Tezos has been validated over and over. And so to to, to, to that end, I'm, I'm, I think it's uh, it's great to uh, to to see the vindication. Absolutely. Uh, and what, I I was reading some of your kind of previous interviews of the last year, and you talk about how. Tezos is playing a long game. It doesn't need, it doesn't matter if other people succeed at things in the short run, Tezos is going to be here in 50 years time. Um, the obvious kind of thing to talk about here is, is Ethereum. And uh, does is the world where Tezos kind of is here in 50 years one where it coexists with Ethereum or Ethereum isn't there? So I, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a binary answer uh, to this, but I do think, you know, there's a spectrum and the spectrum is closer towards uh, uh, winner take all than it is towards like cohabitation of multiple chain we'll have a, a glorious you know striving ecosystem all these chains you know the problem is they don't talk to each other but we'll have this network of change i don't i don't really believe in that um i also don't believe in like i would say um uh, pure you know like uh, pure maximalism in the sense of like no there's only a single chain and every single change just doesn't exist at all i basically believe it you know you end up with a power law and the power law will be stronger than it already is today 
like you know there's already a sharp fall off and it will and it will get even sharper and sharper uh, as time progresses uh, what would you say are the kind of if it is going to be winner takes or what are the battlegrounds to kind of to come by battleground is quite an adversarial world but what, where is it going to be one is it is it in some yeah what are the factors is it in having amazing governance is it in uh, evolution of the platform is it just because is it purely scalability and we're gonna there's gonna be a scale of the cryptos in 10 years that's that more kind of is nowhere near what it is now and yeah. there's a platform to adjust to this I don't think technology is going to be meaningful. Like, I don't think by itself technology is going to be enough of a meaningful differentiators for, for blockchains. You know, everyone is going to scale, everyone is going to get rollups or shards or or, or or what have you, except maybe Bitcoin, who's you know, who who's who by principle, you know, doesn't doesn't want to create. But like um is you know, technology is not going to set a very, very meaningful uh differentiator. What might be is the pace at which you can adopt the technology. So, you know, if you're constantly like two, three years behind on a technology. You know, even though you can adopt it, it's a problem. So the pace of evolution, I think, is going to be uh, quite meaningful, and network effect also is going to be uh, is going to be critical. This is, you know, it's about like, can you keep enough network effect, and can you be sufficiently technology relevant, and can you survive? Is that, that that's what is going to be uh, to to be played around. And uh, what what do you think on kind of the culture now is very different to three years ago? Is very different to 2012, 2013. Yeah. What, what what have been the cultural changes and are they all for the good, really? Um, I don't know that I see a whole lot of cultural changes since 2017, to be honest. I think the, uh, the crypto world is still very much inward looking. Um, there's been more institutional adoption, mostly of, uh, of, of Bitcoin as a store of value. I think that's been the, you know, the trend in the, past, in the past six months and what we've seen. Um, and, you know, the like a so-called ICO movement kind of like ran out of steam, which I think was kind of uh, predictable anyway. So I, I, I don't, you know, I don't attribute that to like a, um, I don't attribute that to a, to um, necessarily to, uh, to a change of culture, just, you know, people, people understanding that it's not, you know, it's not magical. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think uh, we're still very, very much inward looking. Uh, if you look at uh, crypto Twitter today, it looks very much like crypto Twitter in 2017. So I, I don't think there's been much of an improvement, actually. Okay, fair enough. Um, and what would you say is or will be the killer use case on Tezos? I mean, Ethereum, you could argue it's been DeFi, NFTs, and obviously these are universal use cases. No one, saw the, no one saw the killer use case of Ethereum with DeFi until like last summer. Like the killer exactly. use case of Ethereum is a moving target. Now, don't get me wrong, they're doing well, but one of the things that they do well is narrative surfing. You know, so you, stay, you stay on top of a narrative and then a narrative collapse and you get into another narrative and then you get another narrative. And then we'll get all the narrative of like, uh, of, of DeFi as well. Like, good, there's DeFi and DeFi. So for me, DeFi before last summer uh, was essentially decentralized exchanges, lending, all of that is great. And then it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it came to mean yield farming. And yield farming, I don't think is here to. Uh, yield farming is not here to stay. Like, you, at, at least not, not. At least it's not going to be very, very meaningful. Um, I do think that decentralized exchanges are going to stay. Um, the idea that you can have permissionless liquidity is a big deal. So essentially, you know, like, what would happen in 2017? People would run an ICO, then they would have a token, and then they would have to beg CZ with a million dollar to list their token on Binance. You know, that was uh, that was a workflow. And then enters. Uniswap, and then you realize, well, you know, I, you know, I, I, uh, uh, um, you know, there's litigation risk in doing an ICO, and on top of that, after that, you know, it's so expensive to get listed. So what I'm going to do instead is I will just, you know, I will like get a bunch of tokens for myself and just put it, you know, put the token on Uniswap, and then uh, issue the tokens to the people who provide liquidity for the token on Uniswap. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a liquidity mining uh, aspect. So you get a distribution for your token, and you get to pay for liquidity. So in, in that sense, that's very clever. And it's something that works really, really well with the business of launching new tokens. But that can only work so long as there's a market for a bunch of new tokens which can launch. And at some points, you know, that, that kind of runs out of steam the same way that the ICO movement runs out of steam. At some point, people just get tired of just having like one more random new token. And when it will keep happening, it'll just become smaller and smaller. So that the, you know, the, the main use case here is gambling. And in terms of gambling, the... Um, I think it will consolidate around applications which are doing purely gambling as opposed to uh, something that you know doesn't look like gambling but is gambling. And and Ethereum will move on to a next use case. You know, it'll be Web3, it'll be something else. So 
Um, in terms of like what is the killer application, what is the killer application for any of these things? I think fundamentally it's you know big money. Um, I don't really believe so. I don't really believe that you can meaningfully extract rents just by providing a service. Um, you know, in in a store of value model, people hold a token because they think that other people value it, and it's a way to transfer value through time. It's a convenient way to transfer value through time. That is very, very defensible. And the nice thing about this um, is that the more people treat you as a store of value, the better of a store of value you become. If you're trying to be, and, and, and it's very, very, um, it's very, very uncommon. In general, the more of a good and service you buy, the worse it becomes. So if everyone starts buying tomatoes, price of tomatoes goes up, and that's not great. And some people start buying cucumbers instead. But the more people decide to buy gold, for example, because they think it's a great store of value. You know, people are going to say like, oh, well, now gold is too expensive, so I won't buy it. It's not as good of a store value. No, it's better. It has more liquidity. So there's a very, very nice network effect that happens around store of values that don't happen around token that you use solely to access functionality. So let's say you have a blockchain and you have a token on it that, and, and the value of this token is basically that it gives you access to block space, which by the way, is not the case for Ethereum. The Ethereum token by itself does not grant you the possibility of including transactions on the chain. That will change if they do EIP 1559, but they haven't. So until now, there's no economic link between the you know, transactions on the Ethereum chain and Ethereum. It's just that the most convenient way of paying fees is with Ether. Not the case with proof-of-stake network. In a proof-of-stake network, your tokens represent the rights to create a block. And so it's, you know, if, if, if block creation is valuable because of transaction, then tokens are valuable. The problem with this model is that the higher the demand for block space, the higher the transaction fees, uh, the less useful it is, and the more you push toward, and the more you push towards other platform, or so you know, either you push people away to to use the platform, or you push yourself towards scalability models like sharding, where block space becomes so abundant that it's not actually that valuable. The rent associated with block space doesn't become that valuable. It's a bit of an extreme argument. Uh, I don't think that there's no value in doing this type of things. Um, there's also the fact that maybe, you know, maybe because if there's more usage, then you have some network effect, and so the usage becomes more valuable. But I think it puts a very, very strong cap on, on how much rent you can, you can capture. So I believe more in the money use case, uh, first and foremost. In the non-money use cases, I think one of the things which uh, we will see in, uh, uh, on, on, on Tezos are things like tokenization of real-world assets, and that could include um, works of art, digital work of that. We've seen a lot of uh, NFTs trending on, uh, on, on on this or stately, uh, it could be equity, uh, it could be uh, uh, real estate land, uh, all these sort of assets, and then the interactions between those assets. So decentralized exchanges, lending, um, this type of primitives. Also, DAOs, are, um, or you know, as a way to manage a treasury, as a way to manage an organization. Uh, gaming, I think, is going to be very, very big. We've you know had you know, virtual currency predates uh, cryptocurrencies uh, because of virtual worlds. If you ever used you know the Linden dollar in Second Life. Or if, you're, if you ever used um, CISK in the online. Uh, so these visual words have had this type of things forever. And the presence of uh, video game uh, items, currencies, cards on, on, on blockchain, I think, are going to be a busy use case for, for Tezos. Sorry for the long winded answer, but that's oh, uh, very good. That's very good. good. <laughs> you you uh, yeah, went through a number of my questions there, which is perfect. Um, so, guys, I want to open up to questions. That I'll ask one more, and then people can start kind of raising their hands. And we've got a few questions coming in already. Um, but um, I kind of want to talk about something you've mentioned recently, which is um, that a lot of kind of crypto goes after the same crowd of crypto enthusiasts. It's kind of a bit of an echo chamber. Um, kind of begging the question here because it's a university audience. But where is the kind of uh, future of kind of crypto developers? Uh, where are they coming from? Uh, who are the next uh, kind of useful generation of people kind of coming in? Uh, is it people from traditional finance now that are actually going to come in and, and everything's going to change? Well, where is this source of new crypto enthusiasts? No, so the composition of um, so I, I was I was mostly talking about the audience, um, but the composition of the, the research I would say in cryptography and and and, and the developer set has increased tremendously, you know, uh, over the past few years, which is why I was saying, you know, when I went into this space. I went there because it was not competitive, and now it is competitive. You know, <laughs> you have Algorand created by like a Turing Prize award winner. So you know, it's it, it's no longer the case that you're competing against blockchain, which were designed by you know uh, someone who wrote a blog post and then you know like wrote, wrote a message on Bitcoin Talk, which used to be the standard. You know, this is what you were competing against. This is no longer the case. Now you're competing against uh, people who can raise hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars 
and who can hire the best researchers in the world and the best engineers in the world. So it's gotten extremely competitive over the past few years. Uh, and that has raised, you know, like, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, now you have a, a lot of very high, high, high quality academic work around this. And you have a lot of very uh, high level developers. You know, developers will come from the same place they've already, you know, they've always come. They will come from uh, universities, uh, if, you know, if they're out of school, or they will come from uh, technology companies, uh, you know, like all, uh, all the web uh, technology companies uh, will, I think, have like, uh, a number of their engineers move towards uh, crypto, but also financial industry. I think it would it'll, it'll just be fairly uh, fairly broad. Uh, one thing that we have that I haven't seen yet, one thing which is very competitive today, is financial engineering. The financial engineering you see in DeFi is fairly low quality compared to, you know, professional financial engineering. That, that you know, it will change. It will change. But like, if you look at the way people design stable coins or a bunch of systems, it's just it's generally like fully sought out. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of, 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 of like blockchain in 2015, 2016. It's kind of like, oh, I have this big ID. And, you know, no, they are like, you know, they are frameworks. They are like really good uh, uh, frameworks for thinking about uh, uh, financial flaw, financial flows and, uh, uh, and, and, and products that, that you should be applying that you're not. Uh, so we'll get, but you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Awesome. Uh, so a question from the chat. Uh, given gas prices, do you think other layer ones will eat ETH market share or do you think layer two is going to do the job? Well, I certainly need that. I, I certainly hope that uh, other layer ones are going to eat science market share. I hope uh, this isn't going to eat it all. Um, but I also think that ETH, you know, Ethereum community is going to react very strongly and push a lot of L2s. So, you know, it's, 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 it's going to be a first, uh, it's going to be a first competition. Um, I, you know, there, there's some difficulties with layer twos, obviously. Uh, integration uh, in wallets uh, is a uh, is a challenge. You know, if you want people to use a, a layer two, you need to make it very seamless. You lose some composability. Um, you lose a lot of interesting uh, uh, properties. So we'll have to see if that's um, we'll have to see if that's uh, if that's too much of an impediment or if uh, other people move to uh, move to other platforms because of it. Awesome. Well, let's go to a video question. Uh, Jake from uh, Leeds University uh, Blockchain Society. Over to you, Jake. Hello, Arthur. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, this is quite like a personal, like different question, I suppose. Um, obviously, you've founded Tezos with your wife. Um, you know, yeah. What was that like? Uh, what was that experience like? Would you recommend it to others? And if there's been any difficulties along the way? You know, I don't want to get too personal, but it's just interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife is best at answering this question. She's very, uh, she's very funny. <laughs> I don't. She's very happy about it. Um, Ah, you know, there's there's a lot of pros and cons. Um, the pros is that, you know, by the time we started this, we knew each other for a long time, so that's the benefit. You know, you 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 see some people going to business together, and they basically met at a networking event a month ago. Uh, they don't know each other at all. They don't know how each other thinks. They don't know how each other react. And oftentimes, you know, it it doesn't work well. So there's this something very very nice about co-founding something with someone you've known already for years uh, and you can talk to. There's also the fact that we spend you know, most of our time together, so that makes it uh, a lot easier to, uh, uh, to work together. There's, a, you know, there's something I said, uh, I said, well, you know, the great thing is that if I had a, uh, if I had, a, this was in an interview with Kathleen, and I said, you know, if I have an idea at 2 a.m., uh, you know, I can wake up Kathleen and talk about it. And she was like, wait, do you see this as an upside? <laughs> uh, and the downside, of course, is that you basically have to compartmentalize and you have to set time for yourself. Otherwise, the work can invade everything. Um, you can end up just talking about work all the time. And I think you have to be very deliberate about setting times during the day where you're just not going to talk about it. Um, and of course, you know, it can be, uh, it can be very stressful. You know, we went through extremely stressful times uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Cezos and, you know, with, with the emotional component of, uh, 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 of being a couple, you know, sometimes it can, it can magnify things, but overall, I think it made us stronger. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Good question, Jake. Uh, over to Fraser from the University of Edinburgh at uh, Findex Society to ask a question. Hi. Um, Hello. Sorry, one sec, just turn my camera on. Yeah, thanks, Jake, for asking the question. I was too scared to ask. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the standout features of Tezos is like that people can propose amendments to the protocol and vote for amendments to the protocol like, without yeah. a hard fork. Um, and I was curious as to, like, if you think this has been effective and if you've been happy with all the proposals that have been passed 
and also like maybe if kind of blockchain voting systems will get picked up in the future maybe by like governments as a form of kind of direct democracy where people can like vote on laws on a national level yeah so it's been quite effective we've had five upgrades uh, since uh june of 2018 so in just about less than three years we've already had like five upgrades we have a six upgrade that's coming called florence they're in after cities um so it is a very effective way it's more it's much more effective than a hard fork and the benefit is being able to iterate quickly one of the things is that sometimes you know, you'll see platforms launching with a lot of new features and it's it's about 10 times easier to ship to integrate a feature into a blockchain before you launch than after you launch and what we've been trying to optimize with Tezos is the ability to add feature and to keep improving after your launch. Um, and doing the upgrades this way is a big part of it. I don't think it's the only part. Um, and there's parts where we can, we, we can definitely improve. So when we work on an upgrade, for example, there's a number of teams which are involved. There's a team in Paris called Nomadic Labs. There's a team in, uh, in Japan called Ilamda. There's, there's a team called Marigold. So there's a bunch of teams who collaborate. And the problem is that we generally try to produce one coherent proposal because you can't just like have concurrent proposals saying like, oh, well, this, that, this will touch this part of the code and this will touch this part of the code and you can vote for them at the same time because they're always going to interact. Um, they, you know, uh, essentially, uh, 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 protocol improvements do not commute with each other. And they also do not commute when you do mergers. And so a lot of time is spent rebasing the code and having people, you know, uh, send, you send in a merge request and then it doesn't get reviewed right away and something else gets merged and now you have to rebase and so on and so forth. And that's a very, um, that's still an inefficient process. And the way to solve that I think is to make the code a lot more modular because the more the code base is modular, the more people's patches are going to commute. And there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, I'm very happy with the way that the upgrade system works. It works really well, but I think we can have bolder, um, more significant upgrades than we've had in the past. Now, we've been able to change the consensus algorithm. We've been able to add optional privacy in transactions. We've been able to add a lot of things to the, to, to the protocol, but we want to be, uh, uh, we want to go even further than that. And I think for that, we'll need to modularize the code base more, have better processes for, uh, for, 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 for merging code. Awesome. Thank you very much, Fraser. Uh, let's take a few more uh, questions from chat before we go on to the video questions. Uh, who are your favorite builders in the space? This is from Mohammed. My favorite builders? Yeah. Uh, outside of Tezos, I assume? <laughs> or, or inside of Tezos? Or within Tezos, it could be whatever you prefer. Yeah. Uh, so in Tezos, I, uh, I know it's tough because if I start saying this and goals, I'll pick favorite. All right, I'll just pick some names I've ever had. I really love the Baking Bad team uh, in Tezos. Uh, they do a kick-ass job building uh, block explorers, and uh, which which are very useful for uh, for developers. Um, there's also a, a Nonsense team, uh, which is working on a Rust shell for the uh, for the Tezos uh, for the Tezos network, uh, which is also doing a a, a really kick-ass job at this. Um, uh, ICAD Labs is also. Uh, 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 really great. They've built like really, really good libraries as uh, to 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 help people build like DApps as front ends. I'm naming this because you know if you look at Tezos, you will see always you know the big names, but you don't necessarily uh, see those other teams, and they are doing a tremendous job. So these are my uh, favorite builders in uh, in the space. Outside of um, outside of Tezos, let's see. Um, and of course, I'm forgetting some. You know. I'm, I'm forgetting a bunch of, of people in this, and I and I hope they don't take this as as, uh, as 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 you're forgetting them. I just have to like, I just had to pick a few, and I'm just I'm drawing out of the hat. Uh, in uh, outside of the outside of the space, I uh, I think you know I, I I think the job that uh, that that Ethereum is doing is still very impressive. I really like Justin Drake at Ethereum. I think he's doing a great job. Um, I uh, I think that there's also. Um, the the near team is also uh, I think pretty uh, uh, pretty uh, pretty impressive with what they've been doing. Um, let's see. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult question. I don't have a list. I don't, I don't have a list ready out of my hand. If you if you give me a name, I will tell you like yes, this is cool. But uh, it's hard of uh, of the batch to uh, to to reply to that. Absolutely, I thought those were very good answers. Uh, awesome. Uh, some more questions from chat. Um, what, so you've already answered one of them, which is what's your favorite project built on Tezos? Uh, but uh, here's a question from uh, Gerard. 
Uh, do you agree there is an abundance of capital in the space, but a lack of developers? A lack of developers. Um, I mean, there are certainly developers in the space, um, but we, 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 we do need to attract more developers. But in general, if you have a lot of capital, it, you know, having a lot of capital is generally a good, uh, a good way to attract a lot of labor. <laughs> Historically, it's worked well, but uh, of course you need, you, know, you need to have the training that goes with the labor and you need to have all of that. But what I found generally speaking is that when you want to have people work on blockchain related projects, um, some people have attended to find people who are very passionate about blockchain and then you know teach them uh, software engineering i find it better to take people who understand software engineering and teach them about the blockchain bits because the blockchain bits are generally often you know, are oftentimes not the more complicated ones and that you know and, and that, that that trend is changing of course but unless you're really dealing with the very like core protocol unless you're trying to think like okay how do we uh how do we uh, solve the problem of uh, making faster commitments to our uh, entire states uh, in different blocks? How do we pipeline transaction verification and this type of things? Like these very, very um, specific questions, which don't necessarily involve a lot of uh, uh, people. The, 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 the skills are, are fairly generic, not completely generic, but still um, it's, it, it's standard computer science plus a little bit of lore that you need to know around uh, around how to, to program smart contracts and this type of thing. Awesome. Uh, so um, what opportunities are there for researchers and graduates in the Tezos ecosystem? Um, I mean, internships. So we've had typically, uh, we have typically uh, had uh, internships with different entities to work on, uh, to work on, uh, to work on Tezos. You can, you know, um, in general, uh, building a uh, building a Tezos project, there are grants uh, available. There are grants available for uh, for research. Um, there are grants available for a, a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of uh, both academic and entrepreneurial activity around the around the chain. Awesome. Let's go back to a video question. So let's go to um, uh, uh, MA. I think I said that right. M or MA. Uh, I think it's probably I've probably butchered your name that, uh, which I believe who I believe is from the University of York. Uh, so it's you. Oh, hi. Yeah, it's, it's Emmy. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so I'm currently studying law, so I don't really know too much about the technical um, details of blockchain, but I'm more interested in kind of the privacy and obviously it's decentralized. So that type of um, thing to do with it. So I was wondering what your opinion was on the ability of blockchain technology to kind of store and process personal data um, and whether you thought the regulation kind of would allow blockchain to be used as kind of like an anonymity device um, to process data in that way. So I don't know. This is not my uh, this is not my area of uh, of expertise. Uh, you know, I I can answer like questions about you know if you want to build a system which has you know feature X Y Z in terms of anonymity and privacy, how would you build it? And I, that that I may be able to answer. How you know things interact with GDPR and all of these questions, I think is a little beyond uh, is, a, is a little beyond me. In general, you know, I'm I'm of the opinion that you should not put you should not put personal data on the, on the, on the, on a blockchain. You know that that's a, you know the, that's the whole point. Uh, the in, in general, you should not put data on a blockchain. Like data on a blockchain is super expensive. Um, what you should you should the only data that belongs in a blockchain is the minimum amount of data that you need to decide if a transaction is valid or not. You put your data, you only need the data to decide if the transaction is valid. That's it. Don't put personal information on the blockchain. Where stuff like GDPR gets weird is that if someone, you know, let's say someone, you know, creates a company and says, you know what, even though I shouldn't, I'm going to put, the, per, the, uh, I'm going to put personal data on the blockchain. I'm going to put someone's data on the blockchain and they do it just on their own. And then all of a sudden people can, people can say, oh, well, I don't want my data on the blockchain. Well, yes, but it's there and we don't have, you know, technically the way of removing it. So that's very, very weird in, in the sense of like someone could unilaterally create liability for other people. Um, I, 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 I don't think that's compatible with technological innovation to have this, you know, if, I, and I don't know if this is a consequence of GDPR, by the way, and I, I, don't, I don't know enough about it to, uh, to comment, but you know, if, if this were a consequence, this would be pretty stifling for, for, for innovation. Awesome, thanks, Emmy. <laughs> uh, over to, uh, to hear from uh, the University of Cape Town Blockchain uh, Society. Hi, um, so I was just wondering with sort of Ethereum 2, you know, forking and adopting a lot of the 
technological differentiating factors that uh, Tesla's had, like proof of stake. What do you see in the long term as some of the primary technological advantages Tesla's would have to incentivize people to hold it more than other currencies in the future? And then I was also wondering, you know, Tezos definitely has far more governance than the majority of cryptos out there. And how does that sort of, how do you find managing that process works with a board that have varying visions and sort of technical knowledge? Yeah, I wish that Demphir was still in charge of the uh, Ethereum to go on a roadmap. Those were, uh, that was a good time. Unfortunately, those are going to ship. Uh, and, uh, you know, for a while, I, I also said, you know, I, had an art, I have an article basically uh, uh, from early 2017 where I said why Tezos isn't pursuing charting. And I say essentially, look, Ethereum is like tying itself to the sharding uh, thing before proof of stake. Sharding is extremely complicated and it's delaying the proof of stake effort. And here's another solution. And I describe something which is basically the you know like the the the, 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 the proto idea for doing zk rollups. That was my blog post for 2017. Um, it also inspired uh, the, the the work that went in Starkware, for example. Um, and I think I was right. Now they're saying like, oh well, maybe let's not wait until sharding to have proof of stake. Oh, maybe let's do rollups. Um, so yeah, it's 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 sad, but it's fortunate it took them a few years. But uh, and I, I I wish they pursued more more and more sharding. So like I said earlier, I don't think technology is going to be a a, a meaningful uh, differentiator, to be honest. Uh, and I also think that uh, Tezos is also going to you know Tezos has had you know historically a, a technological lead. Um, Obviously, like blockchains are starting to close a gap, but we can recreate a gap because we have this ability to upgrade a little more seamlessly and hopefully not take five years to ship, uh, five or six years to ship a proof of stake uh, improvement. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that. That also looks like a Man United shirt. That is, uh, and if it is, that is, that's not the right. Who which shirt is that? Oh, it's just generic. No, it's uh, like, a, I think it's the Monaco. Well, yeah, Moroccan. Okay, I got that completely wrong. So as long as it's not a Man United shirt, we're, we're good. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, uh, thank you very much to hear. Uh, George, do you want to ask some of the uh, questions that are going around in chat? Sure. So um, we have one question from, let me just find. Oh, it's lagging now. Uh, but the question is, uh, do you believe that we're still in uh, kind of the early stages of blockchain or are we kind of passing that now? And what are the indicators that you'd kind of base your, your answer on going forward to kind of tell where we are in, in the blockchain space? Yeah, I think we're very much in the early days. I mean, uh, even, if you, even if you look at the most successful applications uh, on Ethereum, for example, you know, they, their, their number of users is in, you know, like the thousands or tens of thousands uh, yeah. every day, which is extremely, which is extremely low. If you build, you know, anyone today who builds like a video game or a, uh, a web chatting application who would have this number of users, this would be considered a, this would be considered a failure. Now it's different because there are users who are paying a lot of fees. So if you're looking at like how many how many fees are being paid, it's actually quite a quite quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of money being spent. If you break down why the fees are being paid, you know some of it is network congestion, but a lot of it is MEV, and so a lot of it is basically saying, look, people are gambling, and when they're gambling on the chain, they leave dollar bills on the sidewalks, and then you have people competing for getting those dollar bills. So this is primarily, you know, a lot of the source of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the fees come from that. And those things tend to get erased away over time. Um, so my general feeling is that it's still very, very early and we're still far from seeing mainstream applications. I think some of the first mainstream applications we're going to see will probably be in the video game space and in the NFT space. Awesome. Uh, and then we have another one from Victoria who asks, um, obviously proof of stake seems to be coming quite a, a mainstream in, in a lot of the uh, newer blockchains as well now. So maybe a bit more popular. And what do you see as any improvements that could be made to proof of stake over the next 10 years? Or will we perhaps move beyond it to a different consensus mechanism? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, my ideal, the ideal scenario is that you don't have a consensus algorithm in some sense. Uh, I don't know if it's possible, right? But the ideal scenario is that when, when you think of decentralization, you know, you have to think of decentralization not as a, not as a goal, but as a tool, right? So the goal of, you know, the tool, the centralization is useful for your security because maybe you can make an honest majority assumption, for example, as opposed to just saying, well, I'm going to trust that one person. Um, decentralization is useful for censorship resistance. Maybe, you know, if this person does not include my transaction, this person will. The ideal system 
um, is not one which is really centralized. Yeah, this system is, uh, is one which would be run by a single party uh, that you trust with nothing. Essentially, they run it uh, and then it works uh, flawlessly. Um, you don't have to trust them. You, there's no security. Uh, you know, there's no security assumption. And somehow, if they stop doing it, you replace them with someone else. There are systems which have similar properties to that. So, for example, if you're looking at a plasma channel and you have the operator of a, of a plasma channel, the of course, you know, this, this is backed by a blockchain. But the operator of a plasma channel is sometimes in a, in a state like this. They are very difficult problems in trying to do this, in particular around data availability. But it is an interesting um, it is an interesting thought experiment to see like what can we get. In terms of consensus, you know, the properties that we want, it should not matter who's part of the consensus. That's the ideal. It should not matter if you know you have a stake to participate or or uh, uh, or not. It shouldn't matter if you're burning energy. You should have something where basically you can just connect and see what's uh, and, and and see what's happening. Um, things that you might want, um, you want to be able to support many validators. You know, if you're going to have consensus, if you're going to have decentralization, then obviously you want to have as many, you know, you want to allow as many validators as possible. Although to be honest, most blockchains today, they're not going to struggle because, you know, oh, my algorithm, unfortunately, my algorithm is so limited that I can only have, you know, a thousand validator. You know, go and get a thousand validators first because so very often, especially if you have like, you know, you, you are, you're generally going to have a linear model for, for incentives in the sense of like, if you're a validator and you validate 1% of the network, you're going to get 1% of the rewards. And you want to have a linear model because if your model is super linear, then people are going to agglomerate to be bigger and bigger so that they make more reward. And if your model is sublinear, then people are just going to see bill you and just, you know, they will split their stake and pretend to be uh, many. So, you know, you see blockchains like Cardano, Ethereum, Tcoino, where they say like, oh, your stake can be at much this. And so they will say like, oh, we have this many validators. But of course, there's an incentive to split your stake, so you can't really trust a number. But, you know, even if you have a flat linear model, and you can accommodate as many validators as you want, you're still going to be dominated by the least cost avoider. And so there's just natural economies of scale which are going to come. You can try to have these economies of scale. And I think to some extent, uh, having capital at stake is a pretty good these economies of scale, but it's going to be limited. So you really, you know, the main problem you should be solving is not thinking how your algorithm is going to you know, scale from n square to n log n or anything like that. The main problem you should be solving for is like, how am I going to incentivize enough people to, to participate? Sharding is partially an answer in the sense of like, if you have more of a stake, then you get more stuff to validate and you need to spend more computing resources, but you're not really being paid for your computing resources, are you? You're being paid for like being a person who validates a network, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not, um, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's not obvious that this is the most important factor. The uh, one thing which would be a big breakthrough is that we, 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 we've seen um, algorithm consensus in the space move towards things which are very much like uh, Nakamoto consensus. Uh, so longest chain algorithm based on you know, some randomness and sharing on chain uh, reorganizations and then a synchronicity assumption. So that's what you have with the uh, uh, Tezos consensus algorithm. Uh, which also, you know, uh, uh, which also inspired the Ouroboros one, uh, which is more of incited. Um, that's also what you see in, uh, in a bunch of early ones. And then we move towards more of the, let's take a classical BFT consensus and move it on a chain. And so these are, have the benefit of being asynchronously safe, but they also have the uh, annoying properties that um, only one third can in theory fork your chain uh, or, 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 or stall it. It would be nice to be able to have the best of both worlds in a sense that if your network happens to be synchronous, then it takes 51% to attack it, right? And if your network is not synchronous, then it, then, it, then it degrades to one third. Like having this kind of like graceful degradation is I think possible and not something that's been done successfully. So that would be very, very cool to see something, uh, something like this. Yeah, that does sound uh, pretty amazing if that would be possible, uh, hopefully sometime in the near future. Uh, so we have a question from Gaspar, and I think this is kind of relevant to a lot of the audience who are about to finish university or wanting to build a, a kind of side project uh, with blockchain. And he asks, if you were joining the blockchain space now, what would you be looking at building? Mm, if I were building a new blockchain, uh, I mean, you know, that, 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 that answers the question. I know, you know, if I were to build, to build this from scratch, I know how I would build it. You know, I, there's a bunch of things that would do. Uh, I, I, I would do differently, uh, but you know that's a big topic of like an L one. If I were building in a 
just like an application on a blockchain, I would probably be building a DeFi application, DeFi in the pre-summer 2020 uh, name. I'm working on a product called Checker, which is uh, basically a library for doing synthetic assets. And I think um, like um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting innovation in the financial engineering space here. So I would probably be, be building something like that, or I will be building infrastructure. I think that while it's like Argent, for example, have done a great job at uh, showing what can be done if you really really put some thought into the UX of key management uh, and, and users. But I think this can be taken a lot further. And so I think I'm, I I would be working on a uh, uh, I might be working on a wallet. Awesome. Um, and then we have a question from Pooja who asked, what do you think about the quality of the crypto community in London? And kind of just to add to that myself is, um, are there any other areas where you see there's a lot of block innovation around blockchain across the world? So um, I, I moved to London in February of 2019. Um, and, you know, 2019 was pretty busy and I was traveling a lot for, for conferences. Um, then I went to Miami in November 2019, spent a few months, and then there was a pandemic. I went to Singapore during the pandemic, spent about six months there, returned to London, and then I was in quarantine. Uh, this is a long-winded way of saying, like, I haven't actually had a chance to interact that much with the <laughs> community, even though I've, you know, theoretically been there for uh, over two years now. So I'm looking forward to the world reopening and discovering a little more of the, uh, the community in London. Awesome. Um, and then from myself as well, uh, are there kind of, a lot of the time people have some certain books which they say had a big influence on them when they were kind of younger would you have any kind of free favorite books that you would recommend to the audience today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a good question you know i should make a list of like these are a good question but then you know it takes a while to think of a good answer and if i had a canned answer i would give you my canned answer um <laughs> No worries, we can we can let you think on that one. Um, so Marek has a question around, uh, you mentioned that DeFi, a lot of DeFi projects and kind of a bit average uh, in terms of how they've been built. What would you say DeFi is lacking to become uh, more or just better in general? I think it's lacking like addressing a real problem. Um, like so far it's, it's very, um, it's very um, self-centered in the sense that what do you get in DeFi? So you're going to get lending and lending is either going, you know, collateralized lending is going to be either people who want to trade with margin or they are going to be uh, people who want to take a loan because, you know, they don't want to sell because they don't want to trigger capital gains, for example. That's going to be your main, you know, like uh, uh, tax optimization and trading. So it's very much around, you know, it's very much around like buying and, uh, and selling and holding these things. Uh, then you're going to have DEXs. And again, DEXs are about trading. So the only thing that is facilitated by this whole DeFi ecosystem is a trading of tokens. But, and, and, and a lot of these tokens are here to facilitate the trading of other tokens. It's like, great. You know, now you have all these DEXs and using these DEXs, you can, uh, you know, you can borrow money against your ETH and you're going to use that to buy uni on a, de on, on a, uh, on a DEX. Why do you buy uni? Because it's a great token. It powers a DEX. Um, what, what are your, you know, if you think of it as a country, these are your imports. These are, you know, interactivity. What are your exports? You know, what are you, what, what, what are you doing? So one thing you're doing is entertainment. Uh, people like, like to gamble. And so they can gamble on this. And that's, that's one of your export is entertainment. But I think it, you know, I think it's limited. And I think at some point uh, people realize that, hey, you know, I can get a, I can get a smaller vague with like traditional lending, uh, tra traditional gambling uh, uh, sites. Um, the other thing that you would export is prediction markets. So uh, prediction markets are, they are DeFi, but you really don't uh, hear about them that much. Uh, they're not very mainstream, but I think they're, I, I, I think they have the benefit of like actually solving a real problem. Um, like they can help with insurance. They can help also with learning about things. So, you know, insurance, if you're just buying in the market, learning about things, if you subsidize a market maker of a prediction market to learn about and so I think that's a fan, you know I think that's a fantastic use case. Um, So-called stable coins, especially you know, and I'm not talking about the one which are tokenized bank accounts. I'm talking things um, like similar to Dai or similar to, uh, to to Checker. I think those are very interesting because they provide an alternative to cryptocurrencies, which are uh, uh, which have a, which which mark as a more stable means of exchange and uh, and store value. So I think these are um, these are super interesting. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer insurance, so uh, a little different than prediction markets, but 
if I want to insure my friends easily, you know, you remember maybe the lending platforms, uh, like peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. I, I wish I could see the same thing with, uh, with insurance because of the cost of, of insurance can be a lot lower. Uh, synthetic markets is, are, are, are interesting. Um, the, the ability also, but also straight organization, the ability for someone in a remote corner of the world to own, you know, $10 worth of diversified real estate portfolio. You know, that, that, that's a cool thing. So I want to see a lot of these things uh, in DeFi more so than, you know, I have a, a token from like a lending protocol that I, you know, that I trade against a token for index protocol, which I'm using to trade. It's, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, circular. Awesome. Um, and then Eddie asks, uh, what skills is the crypto sector lacking right now and what should students nowadays focus on to prepare for a bright future in the blockchain industry? I think that uh, this space is very multidisciplinary and to be effective in this space, you really need to grasp all of this. Uh, and I would say you need to have a very strong uh, background is computer science, distributed system, cryptography, although cryptography is Everyone thinks cryptography when you say, well, I'm going to work in cryptos or cryptography, but actually the cryptography part is oftentimes over, um, overblown compared to um, distributed system and, uh, and just like straight standard computer science. Uh, but also, I would say having a really good background in financial economics, market microstructure, this type of thing is very often uh, lacking. So microeconomics, financial economics, market microstructure. Awesome. And then one final question from the chat. Um, Singo says, generally, UX, as you mentioned in, in blockchain, is just quite poor across the board. And this is something that a lot of people are focusing on because it's hard for newcomers to come into the blockchain space when they have to kind of yeah. have complete ownership over these keys, which isn't something they're used to given, say, with your normal bank account. If you send money to the wrong person or something, it can usually be reverted. So what, what kind of reasons are there for UX being in blockchain uh, so poor and how can, can they be solved? I think it's poor because it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. It's really difficult to get a good UX to blockchain. I mean, think about building an, a DAP on a blockchain. First of all, uh, simple thing, you need to be able to handle reorganizations. So, you know, if I send a, uh, if I send a, uh, a transaction on a chain, what am I gonna do? I could have my UI freeze until it has, until it's been included and there's a bunch of confirmation, but that's very destructive to the user flow. So I could, you know, show it in a pending state. And if that state is just like receive transaction that might work, but what if, you know, what if I'm modifying the complex state? So I could show it pending and then, you know, progressively either like delete it and say like, no, it didn't happen. Uh, if I'm evolving in some sort of virtual world and there's a reorganization, do I just like roll back the world? You know, the, and of course, you know, some chains don't have organizations, but like a lot of chains are still gonna have organizations. So how do you deal with that? Um, even chains which have low latency still have meaningful latency. How do you deal with the latency? You basically need to have some sort of like simulation for what's going to happen on the back end on your front end. Even outside of blockchain, you look at like a system like Twitter or Facebook, very often time you'll send a message and then you'll see like two copies of the message because like two databases haven't synced up. So these are difficult problems. And then you're talking about key management, which people are really not used to. Like teaching people about key management and the consequences of losing their key or having their key stolen is also very difficult. Um, there's just so many moving parts that it's really hard to get it right. Now, that being said, with the amount of money that's sloshing out in the space, I still don't understand why um, not more has been put towards really, really good, uh, really, really good UX. Um, it, it seems like it's, it, it, it seems like at some point it will be uh, 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 like something, so, so something will click and, uh, and and we'll see it, but. So far, we haven't seen it. Um, I don't include exchanges. Exchanges have had tremendously good uh, UX because they have also this very, very fast feedback loop. You know, they get like tons of people logging on their websites every day, and so they get all these user reports. So maybe the lack of users is also why the the, the it, it, it's 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 very um, it's again it's a vicious cycle. But if if you only have users who don't mind about the bad UX, you don't necessarily get the feedback you need. So you need to actually do like user focus groups and uh, uh, and like recruit people, see how they interact. It's costly, it takes time. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very much for the insights. I'll hand back to Anthony. Yeah, well, I think we're all out of questions. So just one final one for me, uh, it's just kind of a question we'd always ask, which is what is your advice to the, the average student who's interested in blockchain, wants to get involved, is involved already? What is your kind of, from your, from your perch of wisdom, what is your advice to them? 
Um, sing, you know, learn to sing from first principles. It's very easy to just like read something and parrot it, or uh, you know, take something, you know, take take something for granted, or like you know, think sing sing in terms of tags or labels. Um, and I think that's not that's that, that's not helpful. You really want to understand why things work, what are the basic principles, and once you do, it's a lot easier to think about this space. I, you know, I, I see a lot of people who have preconceived notions about uh, but, uh, about cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And it's only when you're able to really, really, you know, get it down to uh, elementary little bricks that you can, uh, that, 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 that you can think about it well. Awesome. Uh, very good advice indeed. Arthur, thank you so much for a fantastic insight and answers. Uh, and yeah, uh, really going through stuff that, at times in depth and at times with concision, which is, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a very nicely done indeed. So, so thank you so much for your, for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Uh, well, for everyone who joins, again, thank you for joining, asking questions. As um, you're saying, if you're a graduate student and you're interested in Tezos and you want to work on some Tezos related project or you have any questions, uh, maybe you're looking for a job, maybe you're looking for an internship, um, you can feel free to email me. It's arthur.braitman, which is my first name, not my last name, at tezos.com. Uh, awesome. So, you know, if you're, if you're interested, uh, really do reach out. Awesome. Uh, well, I, I encourage many people to do that. I know we had a lot of interest in Tezos when uh, Tezos was sponsoring our hackathon last year, and that was all very fun. Uh, so, yeah, if you are looking, if you're recently about to graduate, you need an internship, I, I can't think of any better place to, to, to do it at Tezos. I know particularly uh, the, the technical team and Nomadic as well uh, were outstanding with us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, please do get involved in the Tezos ecosystem, everyone. Um, well, thank you all for joining. Um, uh, do do stay involved. Uh, we have hackathons and events coming up. Uh, but Arthur, for now, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Have a good the, the 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 slightly lack of sunshine in London, and uh, yeah, see you all very soon. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye bye.